transitions are a long-term process and it's not a linear process. It's about finding out what type of policy instrument you need for what type of actor you're addressing. A certain policy instrument makes more sense at the beginning of introducing innovation or another will make more sense for scaling this innovation. Cities will develop more underground because space is so limited. The underground is full already of infrastructure that has not been strategically planned. I was always curious to find out like, okay, what happened there? Like, what is the problem? How can we solve the problem? Could we have prevented? the problem. That is Katrin Packitzer, Research Associate at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences and Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. As a political scientist with a PhD from ETH Zurich's Institute for Environmental Decisions, Katrin's love for nature enabled her to tackle important questions around transitioning our cities towards more sustainable management and governance of natural resources, from water to biodiversity, and more recently, the world and infrastructures beneath our feet. Through her work, she has been identifying the key ingredients that we need to create transformative change. My name is Peter Marcus Bach, and this is the Grand Challenges Podcast, a show about inspiring individuals who are stepping up to tackle the global challenges that our world is facing in their own unique ways. We reflect on the many out-of-the-box ways our guests have navigated the complexity and intricacies of the environment at the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. On today's show, Katrin and I touch upon the topics of water, biodiversity, and underground resources. We explore how decentralized water infrastructure can make inroads through grassroots movements, suitable policy instruments, and their correct sequencing. We then pivot towards how similar principles should be adopted for governance challenges around biodiversity and our expanding interest in the underground. Detailed information is provided in the show notes over at peterandbach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and please enjoy the show. Katrin, or should I say Paki? Some people call you Paki, right? No, that's just like Zetavi calls me like that. <laughs> uh, that's what's written on the email from the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Yeah, like uh-huh. they always shorten every last name to four letters. So it's Paki, but yeah. <laughs> we'll stick to Katrin. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Glad to have you here. It's going to be an exciting show. I think we have a lot to cover. I must say you're not the first social scientist to be on the show, but we are starting to get more social scientists on the show, which is great because I think we need to look at you know the institutional aspects other than just the technological as well. But yeah, looking forward. Yeah, same. I guess one thing that you are the first person to engage in is a fascination with lichen. Yes. From what I hear. That's true. Can you enlighten me a bit about this hobby that you have? I think, yeah, I don't remember exactly how it started i think it's just like whenever you go to the forest you see them growing on trees and ever since we took over a family garden in october i had them also on my trees on my fruit trees and i was just wondering like okay i really don't know anything about it like in the forest well yeah it belongs to the forest right but then if you're confronted with it and you have to make a decision is it actually helpful for the trees or is it invasive i I really didn't know and so i became really fascinated with it and i took a course at vsl the swiss federal institute for forest snow and landscape research they have a course on that yeah Yeah. they do they offer a course and yeah it was two days and you just get all the basics like what are actually lichen I didn't know that it's a mushroom with an algae no it is a fungus yeah it is a fungus living in symbiosis with an algae okay <laughs> you see I always thought they were separate but no they, yeah. they live in a symbiosis and happily <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we also learned how to distinguish them. I noticed seeing some pictures, they can be quite colorful, but they can spread very quickly across trees and other natural areas. Yeah, they're quite colorful. And also they grow on stone and on trees. Mm. And I think they're sometimes even the color of the stone or (laughs) of the tree. So sometimes you don't even notice them. So it's just really like you have to go closer. And then if you look at it through the microscope, which we also did, because we also learned how to distinguish them, they look also like a little bit like corals like in the sea so the ocean on the land yeah a little bit so and once i knew it's also algae it really seems like a little bit of the sea being on trees it was really cool to look through a microscope i can uh, really recommend to anyone to really take a magnifier or anything and look at lichen it's really fascinating and do you grow them at home as well in your Mm, backyard or balcony i mean i have them in my garden already (laughs) so i guess uh, self-sustaining yeah they're already self-sustaining which was really interesting there are certain lichen then that can indicate 
indicate you the air quality. And okay. I actually have some of them in my garden. So it tells me that there is too much, for example, of SO2 or whatever in the air or in the ground. Like they really are indicators of what the quality of the air is, how old the tree is. So you have all this indication. So we have really this one tree that is like grown over with it. And it is not very tall. So you could okay. think maybe it's not the oldest one, but it is the oldest just by the amount of lichen on it. Uh -huh. And it also indicates how the air was in the last couple of years, in a sense. Yeah. Very fascinating. Nature helps us <laughs> sometimes get a sense of what's going on in things we can't see. You mentioned SO2, sulfur dioxide. Yeah. I remember an example of where they use mangroves as well, back when Singapore was reclaiming some land and they had mangroves set up to test the water quality. So mm. you know, if they weren't doing so well, you could tell. And I think nowadays we look at where the trees are water stressed mm -hmm. in urban environments based on how they establish as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can take so many indications about the state of nature right or the state that we're living in we are not so receptive of our environment as nature is so just really looking at the small species how they behave how they are like or the mangroves i think you can learn so much about the state of our environment basically so we've spoken a lot about nature and i guess <laughs> part of it links a bit to the work you do but you're a social scientist so how does someone with a fascination for lichen and, and fascination for nature also get into social science I think it started with social science, basically. Mm -hmm. So I have training in communication studies and political science. And I came really from a very political science perspective. So really the theory, comparative politics, institutional politics, so all these kind of very more traditional aspects. And it didn't have much to do with environment. But I took a course actually during my master's. And yeah, it was on environmental politics and uh -huh. how to manage resource conflicts. And it kind of clicked in my head. Like it was about uh, specifically water. And I was like, yeah, I want to work on it. And I want to not just do traditional, because at that time I was doing peace and conflict studies. And I was like, yeah, no, I really want to study the conflicts related to resources. And then it just developed from there. And I got the nature part in. So I had really first a more social scientist training in political science. And then I added the nature aspect. And the more I progress my career in this field, the more I'm actually really interested in the nature part. And I want to integrate it even more and more. I guess you found a context to apply a lot of that thinking to. Exactly. Oftentimes, political science, communication, we need to communicate about something. Mm -hmm. Whether it's international relations, as you mentioned, things happening in the world or things happening around us in the environment uh, with climate change change, sustainability debate, that's, I guess, where you found your home eventually. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you could merge it with lichen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or other nature aspects, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a fascination also for just general biodiversity, water governance, but also other, also the underground, like how to govern underground resources. So it's just like really this aspect, as you said, like combining my training in political science and apply it to nature in, in broader terms. Yeah. Speaking, yeah. And so you highlighted and foreshadowed three dominant topics that now <laughs> yeah, occupy your mind true, the water true. space the biodiversity space and the underground i guess what that means we'll get to eventually but let's trace back your toolbox of skills that you've acquired so you got your bachelor in communication and political science at the university of erfurt in 2013 in germany mm -hmm. then went on to do a master's in political science and international relations at the friedrich schiller university in jena and after that pursued some postgraduate studies in peace and security so still in that more political space world issue space mm -hmm. until then you came to eth zurich and looked at doing a PhD where you were more exposed to the water sector and in particular this idea of policy sequencing. Exactly, yeah. And so that sort of hints at one particular challenge we're dealing with, which is urban water systems, urban water infrastructures. If you look at the history, you know, we've built cities along major waterways, major water bodies for safe source of drinking water. And fast forward many centuries, we went from, you know, pretty fascinating infrastructures in Roman times and all the antique times to completely losing that technology in the Middle Ages. And then coming back to, I guess, establishing what we call now the centralized system. So kilometers and kilometers of pipes that help bring clean water to households as well as remove the wastewater and then treat them. But this idea of centralization in the face of climate change, global challenges is no longer a sustainable way forward. And so you looked at decentralization. Could you give me a bit of an idea of what we are looking at in terms of decentralization, especially in the wastewater and the water supply sectors? Just 
just to start like how I contextualize <laughs> the role also of decentralized technologies. And I'm talking about technologies for recycling wastewater, but also rainwater harvesting, maybe also some technologies to not only reuse it, but to use it for other purposes, also for hot water or for not only irrigation. So all kinds of purposes which you can achieve with decentralized technologies. And it can be of different scale, it can be on household level, but it could be also district level. And the idea was really to actually look at nature <laughs> again. To When you think about biodiversity, you have all these different systems that work together. So it's also the where complexity studies come from, right? So mm -hmm. always thinking of systems, how are they most resilient? How are they functioning the best if they diverse? If they have different types of structures, in infrastructure, system components. And this is also what I then applied a little bit to the water sector, looking at it like, well, having just a centralized infrastructure is not the most resilient no, when you come from that perspective, right? Yeah, relinquishing control to one central authority. You know, if something goes wrong in that system, almost the entire city is going to have to suffer the knock-on effects from that. So I guess, as you said, we can think of different scales or we need to think of different scales and maybe not have everything so rigid. Mm -hmm. Exactly, like not so rigid and also make it more resilient to shocks, external mm -hmm. shocks. And that could be manifold, right? It could be things related to climate change, like some extreme weather events or, yeah, just if you think of the worst case scenario, like even an attack, a terrorist attack on your water supply and, yeah, just... Going back to this idea of creating a complex system in the water sector, I just simply thought about with my team, I was embedded in a larger team in my PhD, we're kind of having this assumption, well, what if when it's possible, we integrate decentralized technology? So it's not the idea to make everything decentralized, right? The infrastructure is there, we should use it. Mm -hmm. But if we have chances of, I don't know, like a new district is being built, yep. a new housing district, does it have to be connected to the centralized system or can we actually decentralize it? We also don't know how the city is going to develop or this particular area. So we're flexible. We can also mm -hmm. like, if this is not needed in the future, we are not retrofitting the whole system, but we also have the chance to be more flexible with the demand also that is maybe also fluctuating. We don't know how civilization is definitely going to develop. So it points at population growth, but in certain cities, maybe it won't. So It's a population decline. I've heard yeah. stories like that in Germany, where yeah. certain areas are shrinking or people are using less water. And that's, yeah, that's affecting the system because all of a sudden you don't have water to cleanse sewer systems things mm -hmm. get blocked and yeah these are things you can't really foretell sometimes mm -hmm. because there's behavioral change there's external drivers like climate change like urbanization mm -hmm. so yeah and i mean we're already having the problem now already sometimes you know the systems because they were constructed so many years ago they are already not fitting our purposes they're overwhelmed right yeah. in a lot of places in the world so yeah so why would we continue this prediction game true true <laughs> Why not make our life a little bit easier by increasing the flexibility, by integrating them? Also, if we have to renovate like certain parts of the infrastructure, yep. decentralize it potentially. Like. True, true. And being more adaptive in the process. Yes. And sort of anticipating things slowly and not trying to lock something in. I guess mm -hmm. that's the key word, lock in, yeah. for decades on. Yeah. Of course, associated with this, and we've covered sort of transition challenges for the water system on previous episodes of the podcast. And I can think in particular episode eight with Megan Farrell who told us the story of Melbourne. But when we look at this at a more general level, any kind of major change, in this case, you know, we have a centralized system that's been in place for decades. To now change that system with a new idea is, of course, a very tricky, challenging social process because mm -hmm. you're changing institutions completely. Governance structures have to change. When you think about that, it needs a mixture of policies, of measures that have to be put in place. And this is sort of where the core focus of your first big piece of research work came in, where you looked at how policy plays a role in helping drive this change. Maybe to start with, I guess, when we think of how a new technology can come into practice, you know, there are typical theories or frameworks that help that. One of them sort of talks about how we have to initiate that process. We slowly expand the idea of the technology coming in. And then with all the wins, we try and consolidate that so that it forms daily practice. And other scholars tend to look at it as treating the big existing system as a regime. And then these small new ideas, decentralization or rainwater harvesting, as you've also mentioned, are niches. 
And it doesn't only apply to water, it also applies to other technologies. I'm thinking the smartphone or how automobiles came into place. But what I found very fascinating about your work is that you started to look at this from various angles. And there's really mm-hmm. three big parts of it that form three big pieces of research you've published. The first one being this idea of grassroots movements. So this entrepreneurial thinking that can be applied to how a new idea might take shape and mm-hmm. then help influence or emerge into current practice. Could you tell me a bit about this idea? What I noticed during my research, it also influenced, I think, all of my papers to a certain degree, is to see that it's not always top down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have national policies, we have regulations that impact local politics or regional politics, but there is certain things that also move from bottom up. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to see if there's anything like that, this bottom up movement in the water sector. Do we see actually actors that organize locally and implement decentralized water technologies? Although maybe it's not a top down decision, maybe it's even top down not wanted. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, so I, I did this in-depth case study actually on a case study in Geneva and it was a housing cooperative that implemented decentralized water technology more specifically to just recycle with a vermicompost the water and to reuse it for washing machine and irrigation also to flushing the toilet so they reuse their wastewater to a certain degree so vermicomposting so using vermicomposting. worms yes oh okay yeah <laughs> they have a huge basin with warm like two basins actually or even three. I also saw them, but yeah, you don't see the worms. It's just a lot of hay and earth, it seems, and it's also not smelly or anything, but it just runs through it, and then it's like, yeah, reused for flushing the toilet or for the washing machine. And there is nothing in the Swiss law that actually encourages you to do this, I would Ah. say, because it's mandated that you have to connect to the centralized water system. Mm -hmm. That's why Switzerland also has this great number of, I don't know, 89% or 99% of households it's being connected to the centralized water infrastructure or last I saw the number was at 97% but I guess oh you know, okay <laughs> look in my own teaching I've noticed that the stats seem to vary depending on which yeah. source you consult and which Probably. year you look at but yeah. it's a very high number but it's a very high number which they are very proud of because they mandated it and it helped to force people to connect and to also maybe abolish certain systems that were maybe previously also decentralized when we look like years back and yeah although there's is no regulation or policy that encourages people to really experiment with this type of technologies. This housing cooperative, they decided to go for it. And they are highly motivated individuals. They formed a group of like, well, where do we get the expertise? Part of them are engineers, part of them are architects, like different types of people. And then they also reached out to the responsible of the canton of Geneva and talked to them. And it was actually at the time someone who was very supportive of like experimenting and they just allowed it or found a deal with them. So they had still to connect, but on the other side, they get like other beneficial treatment. For example, with the fees, they looked like how could they adapt the fees because they are actually not using the centralized connection, right? So they found a way around it, but it's a gray area actually, because Mm -hmm. legally speaking, we would not assume that something like this would happen. And I was really curious to see like how these actors managed to do it. So I looked really at their activities. So what were their entrepreneurial strategies? So I used the concept of entrepreneurial strategies and look if I can find these type of strategies in their case. And I found them. So they really used certain techniques like also networking or to some degree building like lobbying groups across Europe. So they really connected with also Germany, France. So also creating this kind of like a network to support more of these bottom-up movements. And to put some structure into this, and this is what I find fascinating about social science research, because you sort of define frameworks or combinations of frameworks that you'd like to put together, Mm -hmm. and you test that on real-world case studies. And in this particular case, on this housing cooperative, I think it's called Cooperatif Equilibre. Exactly, yeah. You looked at four key processes that should be done in order to help bring this innovation to light and with the loopholes that you just mentioned which I think is nice to see because I think too much constraint does not breed innovation so it hampers innovation these four processes I guess it began with framing so articulating the ideas of a social or technical innovation I guess this is really about communicating the idea demonstrating I guess on paper or at a conceptual level what the idea is and that it's feasible then it's about aggregating, so amassing the resources you need to actually realize this idea. 
And then you brought in this idea of mobilizing, so activating people who share the same ideas, the actors that you spoke about to actually try and realize it. And then finally, and you touched upon this a lot, the networking, which I think is essential to give the idea legs so that Mm -hmm. it can be reused, improved, recycled, and especially one term that you use a lot to scale up, Mm -hmm. which is how these new ideas really start to become mainstream practice. And I think my focus on networking was so strong because it was emphasized so much also by the cooperative themselves because they really saw this as their main, yeah, not only to provide these kind of services for themselves, but how can we scale this up? We don't just want to be a lighthouse project, Mm -hmm. one of many. We want to see that grow and we want to see more and more people having the possibility to use these technologies. So that's why, as I mentioned, they really connect to other cooperatives, but also other interested parties who are just interested of adapting this type of technologies. Yeah, And ultimately, you had a system in Equilibri that promotes a shared economy and a sustainable management of resources. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe give me a quick 101. How do these housing cooperatives work? I mean, it's a group of houses that are managed by the community that lives there or... Is there some subsidy from the canton or the municipality or how does it work? So in the case, like, I mean, it's different. It's not um, in in every canton, it's probably a little bit different. But in Geneva, it is really like this association. So they Mm -hmm. form association around it and they have multiple houses. Uh And actually in every house, it has different technologies. Okay. So that's also a very interesting fact about them. So they don't always have the same technology that they develop further, but they really want to see, like, I think to a certain degree, they see themselves as a living lab to a Mm -hmm. degree. And they try to find maybe also the best kind of technology mix for them. So, yeah, I I didn't see the other one. So I was really in the only the one that used the vermi composting. But yeah, they have like, in order to be a cooperative and then you have some benefits from that, like the canton gives you benefits for that, but you have to have certain criteria fulfilled to become a cooperative. So for example, they really look like who can move in there. So it is about income. There are certain things that you have to deliver to become a cooperative. As a vision that's underpinning the idea of the cooperative or a wish, and then they try to find the people that are best suited as the group. Exactly. And then you have the benefit of getting land easier, right? So that that, like having a certain mixture of people, it's the benefit. Like they get, I don't know how it's called, like, is it a lease? Like for 99 years or something? It's a leasehold, I guess. Yeah. That would be the word, yeah. So they get like a lease for 99 years or even more. The one that I talked to, they had a 99 year lease and they apply with a project, right? So Mm -hmm. for example, the canton has a particular land and then cooperators can apply for it and they have a concept. And in this case, water recycling was just one part of it. They had also a mobility concept, an energy concept, a concept for construction. So they applied with that and this is how they basically also are able to get certain pieces of land. But it's nice to see that they're thinking broadly, maybe even if they don't interact yet, but there is mobility, water, those kinds of things in the back of their heads. Energy, of course, I guess would be a very obvious one. But no, very exciting to see this kind of system, but it also allows then for a safe space to test, I guess to circumvent a lot of legislative requirements or legislative constraints Mm -hmm. and is really the first ingredient. So, you know, entrepreneurial thinking, being able to test in a safe space and to sort of demonstrate that actually the idea has legs Mm -hmm. through this entrepreneurial approach of framing, aggregating, mobilizing, and then networking Mm -hmm. to help pass on the idea. Yep. But then other than that, which is really the starting point, what you also looked at that's very important for creating this change are mixes of policies. And I think up until I sort of started doing this podcast and talking to many people, I always thought a policy was just a simple written document sitting somewhere that people have to act (laughs) upon. But actually what you really show in your work is that there are many different types of policies, uh, different categorizations as well. And that includes two dominant ones, one being substantive and the other one being procedural policy. Mm -hmm. What's the distinction between them? So I have to be even more precise here. So it's not really only policies, but policy instruments in oh, particular. Instruments. Okay. <laughs> so apologies, I'm not a social policy, scientist. <laughs> a policy would be more like a frame, a program that contains certain goals, so policy goals and instruments. Mm-hmm. So and in the policy instruments, we differentiate between different types of instruments. And we have the substantial ones. They are like more the classical instruments that a government has in their repertoire, (laughs) in their toolbox. 
So regulations, so regulative instruments, economic ones, and also informational ones, okay. which is also referred to as the carrot sticks and sermons. Uh, nice analogy. <laughs> and then besides that, we have also the procedural ones. And this is a little bit, yeah, like more novel or more recent policy instruments where you really also talk about, for example, participation as a tool. Okay. Or also about a shared responsibility being a tool that can be used. And also with procedural tools, they don't have to be necessarily from the government themselves. Yeah. So they can be also brought in by other actors. So would building stewardship be one such example of a procedural instrument when people take on the responsibility willingly because you empower them? Yeah, for example, yeah, that, that could be one. But also even just setting up a participatory process mm -hmm. is already a procedural instrument. Okay, yeah. And so critical here is that a mix of these policies are essential if you mm -hmm. want to actually drive new innovations and new technologies to be taken up. And in fact, what was interesting about that work was that regulatory instruments weren't necessarily always essential or had the impact or had any driving force in mm -hmm. this innovation. But instead, this more informational style of instrument was always present mm -hmm. um, in comparison. That would be the sermon, I guess, the analogy, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Carrot stick and sermon. That's lovely. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't come up with it. But <laughs> yeah, but that's how they're referred to. And yeah, you're absolutely right. So it's about finding out what type of policy instrument you need for what type of actor you're addressing mm. at what also maybe governance level. So are we talking about the local level, regional or national level? And also the timing, right? Yeah. So maybe a certain policy instrument makes more sense at the beginning of introducing innovation or another will make more sense for scaling this innovation. So we really yeah. have to think about what policy we need. And usually we have multiple goals. We have multiple people that we want to address. So that's why we need a mix because there is not only one goal that we want to achieve. So you have to create a mix and also people are triggered by different things. So as I said, with the example of Geneva, there was not the regulation in place, but they worked with an economic instrument in mm -hmm. the end with working with changing the fees. So it was possible for cooperatives to implement this kind of technologies. Because there was a certain kind of incentive structure as a result of that. Yeah. How important do you think that incentive structure is compared to the more sermon type informational aspects to get people to move and actually create change? Oh, it's it's really difficult to say like which one is more important. I think it's really a mixture because you can offer weavers for fees or like even give like a subsidy for a rainwater harvesting tank or whatever or like some more advanced technology. But if people are not informed about it, if they are not convinced that this is useful for them, that this will benefit them to some degree, I don't think that money will necessarily always convince everyone. Mm. I think money will be more convincing for people that are already kind of on board with the yeah. idea. Like they just need a little bit more incentive to actually decide for it. A bit of a push. As a, a, result, a little bit yeah. of a push. To yes. take the action, yeah. I guess. It's one thing having good ideas, but if you don't act on them, yeah, it exactly. becomes, yeah, any good idea that's not acted upon is, I guess, not worth its money. Exactly. As a result of that. But, Funny anecdote, when I was preparing for this episode, you took me back to the early <laughs> days of this podcast because not only did I see a lot of familiarities from episode eight, which I've already mentioned, but there's a quote in that study that stems from Elena Ostrom, and that is that there's no silver bullet to policy instruments and policy design. And we've covered silver bullets on the podcast before with even technological solutions on episode seven with Abhishek mm -hmm. Narayan. But yeah, you took me back a long way. But that's true. In the 17 cases you analyzed using this combinations of substantive and procedural policy instruments, there was no silver bullet. And it was mm -hmm. really the careful consideration of all these different options available to us. You only knew that it was important to get the people on board for which information instruments were quite effective. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it's also the timing of these different policies because transformation processes, transitions to new technologies, the changes in the way our cities work and our water systems work it takes time. And if you can time it right, then you can create some lasting change. And so I guess what's the take home for policy sequencing to begin with if we start at the top? That you have basically, I would say, two decisions to make, like one decision to make about two options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so either you really plan your policies strategically 
from the beginning, you set up your goal and you set like steps in between how to get there. You think about the policies and the policy instruments, how they should develop, which level of governance you're addressing with your policies, and then you follow through it. Or you decide like, oh, well, no, I'm going to be more reactive to it. So I'm just going to start with maybe a very strong policy and then I see the policy feedback from that and then I will just adapt and adapt and adapt until I reach the goal that I was aiming for. Yep. So I think this is already like, if I think about policy sequencing, it's this choice that is at the center, like what kind of approach you will have to your sequence of policies. Yeah, and you have the more strategic, which is, I guess it takes a bit longer, but it's more robust in getting the new idea to actually take flight because you are slowly demonstrating, testing it, building it out, and then trying to scale it up as a result of it. Whereas the reactive approach is more like, okay, let's do this, but it's susceptible to potential failure or backlash as a result of it. Because, you know, I guess if you're implementing systems all across the city and all of a sudden it fails or you missed something, I'm always thinking of product recalls in supermarkets mm -hmm. or car recalls. Yeah. I mean, similar parallels, mm -hmm. but that that, you know, despite the benefit of maybe a reactive approach being faster for transformation, it faces a lot of risk. Yeah. yeah. I was just also thinking about like cargo bike scandal in Germany okay, or in the Netherlands, but there are a lot of these bikes sold in Germany and they also had to recall their bikes because it turned out that the government of the Netherlands, like some department, they actually tested their bicycles and it turned out that they are easy to break oh. <laughs> certain parts and that's why they had to recall them. And it's exactly that. Maybe, I, I don't know exactly the story, but I just imagine like there was such a boom for cargo bikes, right? Like, mm. I, like all families basically wanted a cargo bike to transport their children, like an alternative to get a car. And I think they wanted to very quickly enter the market and maybe they didn't do the due diligence, the testing that was necessary to really have a as you said, a robust product in the end. Yeah. So I also see it as as you, like I think it can be a way of really having a transition that sticks or really a niche that is developed and it sticks and it has the support from many, many actors, like not only the industry, but also other political levels and also the citizens that in the end have to use these maybe new technologies that are implemented through the policy sequencing. And so in this study, you looked at two contrasting case studies, each adopting a very different style of policy sequencing. The first one was in San Francisco in the USA, and the second one was in San Cugat de Valle in Spain. Could you tell me a bit about the context of these two case studies? So yeah, we chose these two case studies because they use different approaches for policy sequencing. We chose San Francisco and San Cugat de Valle because they are two interesting cases where decentralized water reuse technologies were implemented. They implement technologies for recycling and reusing wastewater mm -hmm. in both cases. And in San Cugat de Valle, also rainwater harvesting. And both cities were comparable to the degree that they are suffering from water stress. So they are hit by droughts regularly or extreme water events that are hard to predict. So there is sometimes a lot of rain, then there is no rain. So they have to have the capacity to reuse also the water that is there and to close a little bit the water loop. But they differed in the approach how to implement these technologies. While San Cugat de Valle, they just like mandated it, the local government. There was no regional legislation or national one. So the local government came up with a plan to implement these technologies for certain houses that have a water, like a pool, a swimming pool of a certain size, and also like multi-party buildings where like, I think it started from a certain amount of apartments that they were forced to have these kind of technologies. While in San Francisco, what we saw there is that they slowly build up the knowledge first. So they didn't start with mandating immediately these technologies, but... They first had a pilot project, which was actually their own headquarter, or I'm not quite sure. But I guess they say, you know, you should practice what you preach. So it's exactly. the perfect <laughs> way to start. Yeah. Do it in your own home and then show, hey, I'm doing it too. But they implemented these technologies. So they had like a system for recycling the wastewater, for also harvesting the rainwater. And they gained valuable experience from there. They had a lot of like participatory processes across departments and trying to really 
learn as much as possible, to bring people on board and then slowly scale. So they built on these kind of policies and approach that they had and the knowledge that they gained and then introduced more demand pulling policies by really also mandating these type of technologies to be used for a certain size of buildings. And I guess on that example, you know, that's where the procedural instruments start to play a very big role because, you know, you can use that to test if the citizens are willing to embrace the technology to, I guess, teach them how to use it to expose them to something that's different from what they're used to. And as a result, you might then foster more adoption and therefore create a minimum safety net for your new technology so that you know it's going to at least be used in certain cases. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, yeah, just like thinking of the case in Spain where this didn't happen actually, right? Where they created the situation of just mandating that people should implement decentralized water reuse technologies, but without kind of bringing the people on board, bringing the industry on board. So Mm -hmm. the technicians were not prepared to handle so many cases. They didn't have experience, which is also a big part. Like you have to have time for experience and learnings, right? To have the skills to work with these kind of technologies. And the people were also not prepared of how to handle the technologies because you have to be careful of what you put in the toilet, what washing machine detergent you are using. So all these kind of questions. So they were unhappy because their systems were failing or they were smelly or whatever. But yeah, because they were lacking also the information of how to deal with them properly. And that was more along the reactive policy sequencing exactly, yeah. approach. Whereas the comparative for that in San Francisco, where it's the more strategic. Mm-hmm. And how does that compare as opposed to the example in Spain? Well, what compares is really that we see in Spain that they were able to scale very quickly because mm-hmm. the local government just simply mandated mm-hmm. the use of these technologies. And yeah, and then we saw that there was kind of a fallout afterwards and the government was not pushing for it anymore that much because people were really unhappy with it. And there was a lot of failing systems. While in San Francisco, we see that there was a very, very, very slow build up. They started with their own headquarters or a building that they belonged to them. And then from there, they developed their learnings, their experiences Then they mandated it for a certain type of buildings based on a certain scale of the building. They were mandated to use these technologies and then scaled from there, like continuously. There's more adaptions to the regulations to include further buildings or types of buildings. And I guess compared to the reactive approach in Spain, you also characterize that reactive approach as doing by learning, Mm -hmm. which I thought was quite interesting because normally the saying goes learning by doing Mm -hmm. but yeah i guess it was also corrected so many times in the paper because people thought i I wrote it wrong but no i really meant it it was doing by learning yeah this is exactly what happened like they didn't first try to gain the experiences with these technologies i mean to be fair they mandated it for certain buildings also like i think high rises of like a certain amount of parties living there Mm -hmm. and also houses with like big swimming pools that were mandated but still this was like encompassing a lot of people that have zero experience with it and it means also all these technicians that have to all of a sudden deal with so many systems so it was really just overwhelming the system to a certain degree yeah but either way i think it's undoubtedly essential that policies need to be sequenced in a certain way Mm -hmm. and mixes of instruments as well if we want to create lasting change but that they are sometimes better and maybe not so good ways to do it. Nevertheless, there are two strategies and with them comes the benefits and the disadvantages if you're going to choose one of them to go for and you have to assess it. Again, no silver bullet, but you have to assess what your particular area, city, which approach they can potentially embrace. Mm -hmm. But two contrasting case studies. So you could really trace the different stages of how First of all, what mixes were used, but then how it went from that initiation phase to the consolidation to a certain extent. Exactly. And then track as we go. Yep. And this brings valuable lessons for many other case studies who want to create this transformative change. If you could sum up this discussion around creating this transformative change into, I guess, the key points, not that it's you know the silver bullet, as we said, but to give someone a starting point for their own project, what would these be? I think really first understand your context. Like, do you have people behind you? Do you have the key stakeholders behind your project? Because if no, then you should maybe start with maybe some policy instruments that are initiating a participatory process, collaboration, and maybe start very slowly of like creating this technology push 
developing your niche and bring people first on board and maybe start with also some first pilot projects where you gain not only learnings, but also evidence that your system works, right? And that it convinces even further people to join you or to be at least supportive of your project. So I think really to understand like the actors around you and how they view your project is essential to decide whether you can go full on and just implement and just mandate the use of your technologies or if you have to be more strategic about it and more subtle, more, more subtle about yeah, it. Very true. Yeah, that I think is it's one thing that is very important to decide and yeah, also maybe also identify these actors that are supportive of you, that it's not only to understand how they behave towards you, but also who are the multipliers or like people that can really help you to bring others even on board. The champions, as we have referred to them in previous episodes as well. Yes. And also maybe another learning would be also to really think in the long term, right? Yeah. Because transitions are a long term process and it's not a linear process. So also think about policy feedback. So also how certain decisions affect also others, like how might they react? How will I adapt to it? Like maybe also have certain transition pathways that you think of to reach your goal. So mm. really having this long-term game, <laughs> yeah. a plan to get from where you are now to where you want to go. I like that long-term game plan. <laughs> Strategy requires that, mm -hmm. definitely. And so now you're at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences and you're also at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. And you've gone beyond the policy sequencing space mm -hmm. into other topics that you've already hinted at, one being biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So how did you bridge from water into biodiversity? I guess it makes sense if you went through nature and you have that <laughs> love for nature. Yeah, and I think it was especially this, but also the aspect that it dealt with networks. Mm. So in this project, I'm really looking of bringing together a socio-ecological network and I'm more responsible of understanding the social network. So really understanding like who is involved in biodiversity governance at a local level, but also regional and national level. And in particular, what I will focus on is to understand what constitutes good governance yep. in biodiversity, but also like how does it work transboundary. Yeah. So especially in Switzerland, we share so many borders with other countries and there are green areas in between. And the idea is also to understand like, okay, if we want to have good biodiversity governance, we would assume that there should be some collaboration or at least exchange how on both sides people deal with their green areas. And this is like the thing that I want to <laughs> I want to actually find out if they do. And if they don't, why aren't they? Because it is important from a perspective of ecological connectivity that certain spots are connected and certain maybe green areas are preserved for species to also preserve yeah. <laughs> in the end. And you work with Manuel Fischer, whom we've had on the show before in episode 26, and we've touched upon this subject as well of mm -hmm. socio-ecological networks. Listeners, you can check that out for even more context about the projects because mm -hmm. I believe that's similar and expanding upon that idea exactly. that you're working on now. And I guess there's the two elements of good governance would include that participation, but also the horizontal accountability, as exactly. you've talked about. Two people share land that are adjacent to each other, that they coordinate. Mm -hmm. And so you also mentioned transboundary management of metro green areas. So it's the green spaces within the inner city areas. Exactly. And I guess that's not just for biodiversity, but it's also for other additional benefits also to humans. Exactly. Yeah. So these areas fulfill multiple ecosystem services, right? And biodiversity being a very big one of them, in my assumption, like, yeah, if it fulfills the biodiversity ecosystem, that's already like also a very big contribution to our life or to the city life. If we have these pristine spots where species can continue to live. But yeah, it, it is more from the perspective, as you mentioned, because, yeah, I forgot about this part that it's really like the metropolitan regions, right, that continue to expand and maybe that expand towards each other towards a border and there are just like green spots in between left that are less and less connected to each other and we have to understand how can they 
remain and like what are we doing actually what are we considering actually as biodiverse all these questions like what are we even considering a good management of this mm. green plot for example yeah as the term green belt come to light mm -hmm. in all this work as well because i find that historically in city planning many cities have adopted the idea of a green belt to or ensure, corridor yes or corridor yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And it goes into the idea that I mentioned you know, with the ecological connectivity. If we have a green spot, but it's just surrounded by infrastructure and buildings, like species cannot continue to find like the spaces to find food or to just like exist basically so they need to, to fly from one spot to the other or yeah. to move or jump <laughs> if you're a frog so they have to have also this diversity of spots mm -hmm. they, they need sometimes tall grass or like a forest more foresty like or more trees different types of bushes so we also cannot have just uh, parks for example parks are not enough in a sense yeah and related to all the technical aspects and we have covered the idea of frogs moving across landscapes back in episode 14 mm -hmm. with shanine boliga who's i think also involved in this yeah exactly yeah. there's also a whole social institutional aspect to ensuring that we can create these connectivities and as mm -hmm. you said transition is a long-term process so we can't just go and take all the buildings out and bring that park closer to other parks mm -hmm. we have to do this systematically and i guess coming back to what we've spoken so far about the mixes of policies or mm -hmm. instruments that can help create that change and it exactly. begins with the people yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. it is about the people yeah no, definitely but on the one hand, you got the above ground aspects, but you've also taken a keen interest in looking at the underground. And this I find quite fascinating because, you know, I think, okay, as an engineer, pipes are underground, sure, it's important. But you go much deeper than that, pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> much deeper. So, yeah, you're right. This is my other project close to my heart that I'm working on. So I think there is even more the link to my previous work because water plays such a big role in the underground, right? With yeah. groundwater and also the pipes for water supply, but also wastewater, which are also in the underground. So there I see them maybe like people will understand why I, I'm interested in the underground, but it's more than that. Like there are so many resources there, right? We have also geothermal energy, we have geomaterials and space itself is obviously also a resource. It's actually easy to forget. Yeah. I remember a cross-sectional diagram I saw where they were trying to show that the space for trees on the streets is actually quite limited on the ground because you have, as you mentioned, geothermal, we've got the water pipes, we've got the telecommunication lines, any other energy or gas lines, electricity, as well as, I don't know what else is there, there's groundwater as well. Mm -hmm. And then I guess one other thing that comes to mind because I was recently reading into it is soil biodiversity. So mm -hmm. you know, we dig up everything and then we put it back in place so it looks neat, but we're also disrupting the microbiome in the soil as well. And we know also very little about it. And I mean... We have some knowledge about the area very close to the surface, but the deeper we go, the less we know. So we we know that there might be some species living there, some little bacteria or whatever, but we don't know like how important are they. What would disturb them? Like if we build a um, geothermal plant there, like energy plant there, like will it disrupt the system to a degree that it's kind of endangering also the whole ecosystem there there's so little knowledge like we are creating right now the knowledge there's research going on right now but there's still so little known and i think the biggest problem is basically that it followed for a very long time the first come first served principle yeah. much of the development that we have yeah, <laughs> with infrastructures true, yeah. i mean also water infrastructures for a long time it was like oh yeah well we're here first let's build this and then we'll deal with the consequences afterwards <laughs> Um, but also we see that a lot of the mistakes that were done above the underground are being repeated underground. Oh, so we yeah. have already like lots of infrastructure put there that is maybe not strategically thought through. And we also see first conflicts. And this is going to continue because we see a trend right now that cities especially cities, will develop more underground because space is so limited. And also with climate change, there is more temperature stability underground. So true, true. a lot of facilities will move underground. And with this, you will have conflicts because the underground is full already of infrastructure that has not been strategically planned. I'm smiling because you know I mentioned all these different infrastructures, but the one obvious one that is even bigger and in your face that I forgot is that half the buildings have basements. Yes, <laughs> yeah. 
So, For example, yeah. and these basements will probably even get bigger. They're just going to get deeper in a sense. Yeah. Um, we see examples in Singapore already. They have this problem of space. So they are really developing the underground. They are going really deep. You just reminded me of an early childhood memory of mine because I grew up in Singapore. And I remember when I was in the malls with my mom, you know, we were going somewhere, we would go and park the car. And I remember the basements are numbered from one to higher numbers the deeper you go. And I think we were at B3 and B4. And as a kid, I was like, how deep does this go? <laughs> and how does it? How is it even possible to build this deep? Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's a very serious concern. I think, yeah, if we're running out of space above, the only, you know, other than leaving the planet, which is, uh, I guess, in progress with all the work going in the astronomy field. Absolutely, yeah. And it's not only the space, not, but also the temperature. Like, yeah. I mean, for example, Montreal is an example of it. They created underground, I think, stations and like malls or something because of the temperatures above. In winter, Like yeah. in winter, like you cannot go outside. So we see, and also the same could be for heat, right? Not only the cold, but also for the heat. So there are many reasons why we would like build underground. And also mm. with technological advancement, we also can make use of so many more resources. So now we can use geothermal energy, for example. We are able to store maybe nuclear waste very deep on the ground. So, True. Or like also carbon capture and storage, right? Mm -hmm. This is also becoming more and more a question for many countries to consider. So all these things are going to move underground and we see that the conflicts, for example, that certain technologies have to go to make space for others. For example, in Zurich, there was a case where people had like shallow geothermal energy and then, well, now we want to build here a tunnel for transportation. So conflict, who is going to move here? So and then you have to also decide what are your goals as a society? Like, how do you view like a sustainable development of the underground? And these questions are not answered. Like we don't have answers. What is a sustainable underground management? Yeah. And one last thing is, I think we also don't think enough about synergies. Mm. So, so true. a lot of these technologies can be combined. They can profit from each other. So if we think about it more and encourage it more and also integrate it as an essential part into planning projects in the underground, I think we will do a big step towards a sustainable management. Yeah, And there's one quote I read once that I remember, and that is that we know less about the depths of our oceans than we do about space beyond Earth. And mm -hmm. I think the same can be applied to, you know, the terrestrial land. You know, we know less about what's underneath our feet than what we've discovered in space so far. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And it's certainly very exciting to see where this will go. Yeah. But of course, again, that challenge, if individual institutions around water, for example, are quite fragmented and siloed in how they make their decisions. And we're only just starting to integrate them and see the synergies of taking rainwater and using it to flush toilets. Then how are we going to be doing this with cross-sectoral kind of collaboration? And I guess you offer in some of these key works that we've talked about today, some ways that we can go about that. Yeah. And I hope to continue this work really with this cross-sectoral and like innovation transitions, how they can actually happen. I'm just right now trying to combine another transition studies framework, which is the multi-system dynamics. So thinking really also about different sectors, systems, how they interact with each other in a transition process, mm. which we can observe in the underground, right? We have like True. energy systems, water systems, transportation systems, and they all kind of have to interact with each other and also maybe transition in a particular direction that we can have in the end sustainable underground management. It's always nice when you find the perfect case study to test <laughs> these kinds of transition yes. ideas or other kinds of frameworks on. And I guess that's what makes the research exciting, especially in the social science space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, long-term strategic complex thinking, thinking about synergies, that's really where you're heading to. Uh, what else is in store for you in the coming years? Oh. <laughs> what else? Yeah, I just basically hope to continue my work in this particular field, like especially also with the underground, because I feel like it touches a lot about aspects that are interesting to me. It's like also, as you mentioned, biodiversity also plays a role in the underground. Water plays a role in the underground. So I feel it encompasses a lot of the topics that I'm very passionate about. And I can really also integrate my experience with transition studies, but also political science there. 
So I feel like this will be a research field for me in the future that I want to progress in. And yeah, just like whatever piques my interest, I guess. I mean, also with the biodiversity postdoc project, this was really not planned in the degree. It was just purely the interest for that topic. And I hope to have this space that I can continue to, yeah, just be fascinated by certain topics and integrate them. So we'll have uh, frogs posing as parking inspectors next time. We have a river <laughs> flowing straight through the car park. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess uh, opportunities to then... Maybe a project about lichen. <laughs> maybe a project about lichen, exactly. So yeah, no, that, that would be dreamy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can use them for various purposes. You yeah. never know. Yeah. But it's certainly a very exciting time. And I wish you all the best going forward with that research. And I want to see what happens when we bring you back at some point to talk about this in greater detail in a part two. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, Katrin, it's been fascinating covering this broad range of topics, but somehow all comes back to a lot of this, you know, how we use policy instruments, how we think about transitioning where we currently are at to where we want to go. And like I do with every guest, I also like to ask my guests some questions more about themselves so listeners mm -hmm. can get to know you a lot better. So what inspires you to do what you do on a daily basis? What is that one driver that you, you wake up with every morning to then embark on this research journey? I think it's just simply curiosity to understand how things work. I mean, already as a child, I wanted to become like a police investigator. Oh. <laughs> Not because I wanted to work for the police, but because I wanted to investigate, actually. I was always curious to find out like, okay, what happened there? Like, what is the problem? How can we solve the problem? Could we have prevented the problem? And to understand how things are connected with each other, like why did they lead to this outcome, not to the other? How can we change them to another outcome? So all these questions already I don't know even as a child fascinated me in a yeah less science aspect but with everyday life topics also I mean in other aspects of life let's say and yeah it continued like this love for investigation for researching finding out like how things belong together and it just stayed on the explainability of the world yeah the explainability yeah and also having I mean just a the privilege of learning about the world being your job yeah. <laughs> is very motivating, you know, like just having Definitely. the privilege to start new projects and really dive into it, into a new theme or, or a new subject and just get all into it, understanding every little bit of it and then continue with another topic hmm. and just, yeah, just having this possibility of diving into various different fields and topics is just very yeah, motivating for me. So it wasn't the 90s and 2000s uh, criminal investigation shows that um, brought about that motivation. Well, I, I have a guilty pleasure for these shows too, <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> I mean, like I'm a big Criminal Intent fan and <laughs> or I was, like now I watch it less, but I used to watch it a lot in like true crime and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> I used to watch this a lot, yeah. I saw a few <laughs> and a few previous guests also have. So, yeah. Maybe there's a connection there. Maybe there's a connection. No? <laughs> but it's generally fascinating to see how you then piece together the story from the little bits of patchwork you get, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then are able to logically reason through every piece of evidence that you've got. And science in a way is like that social science yeah. even more so, I would say. Exactly. Because you're building on narratives, you're building on you know little pieces of information you collect, especially from the people themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about the world that we're currently in or your current situation, what would you change and why? I will talk about my own world, maybe, <laughs> okay. because I think it's such a huge task to change something about the world. But I mean, I want to talk about the world that I'm most acquainted with, right? So it would be the academic world, like academia, where we are part of it. Oh, I thought lichen. <laughs> no, not lichen. Really the world that we are yeah, just living in our everyday life. And what I would change about the academic world would be to end the dependency on funding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like killing a lot of my curiosity, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like, and I mean, I, I think we would be more freer if I could just like, you know, as you said, do a project about lichen <laughs> just because I'm interested in it. And I think like there is something about it. But if I just have to convince now a third party and it doesn't fit in their policies of what they deem interesting for society, you will not get funding. And I understand that we also have to 
prioritize, but I would love that there would be less dependency of funding and just like also different career paths, right? If I look at you and me, basically, how we have to find a space where we're not just necessarily becoming professors, but we want also to exist as researchers. Why are there no multiple pathways to become a researcher and what it means? Like, why can't we differentiate there more? Like, why is there only this one path to tradition. professorship? Yeah, tradition. I guess, uh, can we use a mix of policies to try and change that? Yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> I mean, personally, I, you know, I'm someone who, yeah, I haven't gone along that traditional path and I'm happy that I haven't because I mm -hmm. think there's many ways you can make a change in the world. And, you know, I choose to work along the academic pathway but at the same time I also choose to work along the science practice you know and implementation pathways and I think it's important what you make of it and the story you paint for yourself and you know if you can see that the work you produce makes impact in the world I think yeah, mm -hmm. you know you've definitely done something and we're not stuck in your ivory tower and we've touched upon the ivory tower a few times on the show now mm -hmm. and yeah I think it's let's see if it changes in the coming years, but it is certainly a very tricky kind of career path because, you know, we have these expectations or lock-in effects from traditional academic processes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Was there a key moment, book, paper, person that completely changed the course of your career or mindset? I think it would be really the course that I already mentioned during my master's in peace and security studies. It was on environmental and resource conflicts. And there I was just like first exposed to the questions of like, oh yeah, actually I can combine my political knowledge with the environment and see like how we can prevent actually resource shortage, how we can manage them better, how can we make our use of them more sustainable and become more flexible in the use of it. So yeah, that would be really that course. And the second one would be really my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, Eva Lieberherr, that also changed my career path or life path because actually she first, uh, I applied for a research position there, like as a research associate. And she declined my application. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, she just declined my application. And after a couple of weeks and months, she reached out to me and she said to me, like, actually, I really liked your application, but you were overqualified for that position oh, no. that you applied to. <laughs> and yeah, I was wondering if you want to do a PhD. And I have two topics to offer to you. One is on forestry and one is on water. And yeah, I couldn't believe it when she said it. it's about water and water governance. I jumped at the opportunity and I formally applied to this position and I received it. So that really changed the course of my life. And it also led to the fact that I'm living here right now in Switzerland. I moved for that position here. So And yeah. now you're based here. Exactly. Yeah. Now it's lovely to see how in you know, a certain individuals and in certain moments that we we take really change the way we see the world and as you mentioned it's you know you studied that toolbox of mm -hmm. key critical skills and were able to now apply it to a context that was close to your heart as well mm -hmm. and you know as time has passed you've gone deeper and deeper into that context pun intended <laughs> <laughs> what was one of the most challenging situations that you've ever faced in your career to date and how did you overcome it mm, i would say it was my burnout during my master because I have to be more precise, it was my master's. I I don't know, like I, I thought I would be able to pursue two master theses at the same time. That was two of them. Yeah, uh, and parallel. Oh, <laughs> so I actually didn't finish. Ambitious. Yeah, ambitious, but um, to a fault, I would say, <laughs> sometimes. And actually that led me to work on this. So yeah, I first started this master's in political science and I didn't finish it yet, but already applied for the postgraduate because I knew I wanted to do peace and security studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I thought, oh, easy. I'm going to just write two master theses. Like, first, I will start with the one from the political science from my university in Jena. And then when I'm done with this, I will just write the other one, right? How hard can it be? How hard can it be? Just a year of continuous wow. writing of master thesis. And yeah, I had to realize it was impossible. I became so stressed. I, I couldn't sleep. And yeah, it basically led to a burnout. And I had to fail my first attempt uh, for the master 
thesis and then just I had more time to write it later on and I finished it but it really led me to take a closer look at me and myself <laughs> and to yeah question actually my ambitions my work mm. ethics my definition also of work or what is also work performance like I come from a household my parents have both jobs where the output of the work is quite physical or you can count it you okay. know yep. so for example my father is a taxi driver. At the end of the day, he can tell you how many passengers he had, how much money he earned. So it's very kind of like tangible in a sense. Yep. And I don't know, I was never, I had no guidance of how to deal with this very mental work of being like researching like also university prepares you for that but also you don't get like a guideline how to deal with it like that you cannot necessarily always measure your output directly mm -hmm. so I had to really also in the during the PhD this topic continued to follow me to really understand like okay what is actually my relationship to work how do I measure my performance what is a good day as a researcher yep. like how can I be happy with my day if I didn't produce anything tangible and I just thought about a research problem or I just outlined something or I just read papers. So this was really something that I had to address for myself and to find like an own answer for myself, how I want to work, how I want to measure my own performance. And yeah, I think this was really a challenging time, but also a very, how to say, I think it changed me for the better also. Like it no, was definitely. challenging, but it changed me for the better and helped me. And it gave me actually the tools to deal nowadays being like a, a postdoc or even more independent researcher and even having less like a boss who tells you what to do or what is a, a good output of your work yeah this story reminds me of a book that i recently finished called slow productivity by cal mm. newport very good books i can his, his books are really helpful and insightful so i can highly recommend them but uh, in slow productivity we do read about the problem of how you quantify productivity for knowledge work mm. which is what a lot of jobs are like now and then oftentimes they use this sense of being busy you know so being present at the office and talking to people in meetings and being here and there and looking busy as a measure for productivity which it quite frankly is not and this hasn't gotten any better and the pandemic i think has made things a lot trickier to navigate mm -hmm. but um yeah there are some gems in that book i can highly recommend it i certainly also question you know whether i'm being productive or whether i'm you know burning myself out quite often as well so mm -hmm. yeah but it's a it's a very important consideration we should make i think in you know our lives and what we see work as, and I guess what we see as also our passion in research, this is a lot trickier because mm -hmm. oftentimes we like to research on things that we're passionate about. Yeah. So. When it overlaps, it becomes tricky, Yeah, actually, because it, it becomes less of your work, but also, yeah, something that you identify with. Yeah. And then it just gets so tricky to, yeah, to keep a distance also to your work and not to make it all personal and to not give all of yourself yeah. into it. And yeah, I think it's a lifelong process to always ask yourself. Like, I, yeah. I think there's no definite answer and it's never a closed chapter. It's an iterative process that you continue to ask yourself, okay, what is my relationship to my work right now? Mm -hmm. And is it healthy? And should I change something about it? And I guess diversity, balance, you know, doing other things for a time being so you're not constantly exposed to that. And you were mentioning in a previous conversation we had that as a kid you played the piano and tennis and that you're now starting to pursue those childhood hobbies again mm -hmm. in your free time yeah i think it was an answer to pursue certain hobbies again as you mentioned piano and tennis to have something else to have this like additional outlet to also take your mind off <laughs> <laughs> work and do something else like also tennis it's just such a whole body workout and also piano like you cannot think of anything else than just playing right now because otherwise you you're gonna sound like shit <laughs> so you have to really be present there you have to really concentrate and put your focus only on that and i really appreciate these type of activities where you can just like also cooking I, I mean I love cooking because somehow like yeah if you cut something and you follow the process you can get so into it but if you're distracted then um, yeah even worse than <laughs> playing the piano I that's true <laughs> yeah you might end up with a very salty meal or <laughs> a very red looking meal exactly without chili <laughs> yeah <laughs> for example yeah so what tips and strategies can you offer in terms of time management? How do you maintain a balance between your professional and personal time? Yeah, I, I don't consider myself to be a role model there. <laughs> but yeah, I think 
my strategies would be really to also involve things that challenge you in a different way, be it physically or mentally, that trigger certain different parts of your brain, you know, like playing music or being creative with arts or sports like this kind of things really help with the balance but also like tracking time I started it actually this year I never tracked my time and I think this will give me in the long term a better understanding of how much time do I also need for certain things okay how much time is also maybe wasted on certain things like where could I also get better in that sense but also like for myself like to see like okay yeah you really worked too much this week so how, do you, how do you week, track it with Google Calendar? No, there's like, I, I use Toggle, like Toggle Track. Toggle Track, okay. Yeah, oh. it's, it's just a tool and it's really useful because you can use like, for example, hashtags oh. or projects and then you can really at the end of like a month or whatever, see a report, how much time you used for certain tasks uh -huh. that you defined. Interesting. I must check that out. Toggle Track. Toggle Track, yeah. Mm. So we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. And I guess, you know, listeners can try it out to see what they think of it too. Yeah, I think it can really influence your own sense of how much time you need for certain tasks, but also impact your project management in the long run. Like if you have to estimate for certain tasks, like how much time you want, you want to use for that task. Often it's an estimate, but if you've done it for a long time, you know, like, okay, doing interviews cost me always that amount of time. Mm -hmm. So you become also more precise with your project planning. Yeah. And plan and maybe more money in more hours and you can manage also yeah. if uh, things get very busy exactly uh, yeah. when to sort of take a break mm -hmm. i guess break times are also part of it yeah. part of it times for tennis times for lichen times for <laughs> piano yes yeah very interesting tip and we'll definitely have to look at that so what's your general tracking at the moment Do, are you satisfied with time management and the way you're spending it or where are areas for improvement that you foresee i think i could definitely improve to not work on weekends <laughs> sometimes i still do it i'm not very proud i mean i compensate i then maybe work less during the week but yeah i think this is really going against all the <laughs> work-life balance principles <laughs> that are out there but sometimes yeah i just yeah if you have lots of students and you have a lot of work you just have to find time for certain tasks sometimes yeah. but this is something that i definitely want to be stricter with myself mm. to really not do this anymore and i would say the second thing is really like yeah just finding ways to be more efficient with certain admin tasks right yeah. this is as you mentioned meetings right i think it's crazy how much more meetings we have and i think this is somehow also a consequence of the pandemic because yeah. now everyone can all of a sudden have an online meeting. True, true. Before that, yeah, most of the meetings I had were in person and then you would have to travel. Like, so how many meetings can you put into a day? That's now true. Now you can put like unlimited meetings in your day almost. Back to back to back. Yeah, yes. back to back. And also usually you never had back to back meetings because you would still need to leave their room, maybe go to another building, meet someone there. So you always had like a small break, a transfer time. Yeah. And now we expect ourselves to be just immediately present in a new topic with new people about a new context and it's just like I, I think I find it very very stressful and overwhelming yeah definitely. for sure yeah so this thing I, I think I can get better implementing I actually learned yesterday a new tool that blocks automatically time in your calendar oh. for focused work time oh nice so it automatically will search for uh, a period of time that you defined like maybe you want to work three hours focused not have any meetings coming in and then it will search for your calendar for these times and block them interesting in advance so you you don't even get tempted <laughs> to, book to, put, to book meetings or let anyone else send you a meeting request for that time. And what's it called? Viva Insights, I think, for Teams. It's Viva a tool Insights. for Teams, actually. Okay, interesting. Yeah, well, I guess I'm on Outlook. I manage things through Outlook, so... Yeah, but uh, yeah. I think then it should work. And it should work. Oh, Viva, Viva Insights. Viva Insights. I must try it out. Yeah. <laughs> I think I fail to block out focus time for myself until it's too late, and then eventually I do it, and then I forget about it again, so... Let the computer do it. Let the computer do it. <laughs> <laughs> no boy <laughs> we'll manage our lives yeah. in the next few years yes so what other advice can you offer to young aspiring social scientists researchers I would say looking back at my own time when I started really with my PhD and everything I wish I have taken more time before I really started to work on it Mm. Like to really get acquainted with the field, understanding the discourse and really, really figuring out what is it 
where I see a gap and what I want to contribute. Because I think we are living in a time where we don't have that much time to really get into a topic very deeply. But people want to see results. There are deadlines. You are only having this amount of time for funding. So there's always this time stress component where you're always kind of limiting yourself. But if you have the opportunity and the chance to block some time in the beginning of starting your research uh, for really getting into a topic, I think it's very valuable. You will feel much better about your contribution and it will be also more relevant to the field in the end. So this is something that I also, when I talk to people that just start a PhD, I see them so eager. They want to get it off the ground. They want to like mm. formulate research questions and hypotheses and they already have the methods that they're going to use. But like, no, just take your time. Like you don't have to rush. I mean, it's not beneficial actually, I think, for research. Rome wasn't built in a day. No. And I guess a solid foundation is what you need if... You want to be the world's leading expert in that topic. Yeah, for sure. And I think another thing that really helped me as a young researcher was conferences. Mm -hmm. I think this was really always so inspiring. And even if you are feeling sometimes very alone with your topic, yeah. maybe you have a research group where everyone is doing something else than you. This is really a moment where you feel part of a community, where you really can like connect to people, where you feel relevant with your research. And I think it's also such a great opportunity to meet people in the field, to connect with them and really get valuable feedback for your work before you submit it somewhere or to develop it further. I can so agree. I enjoyed all the conferences I went to as a research student. And yeah, through that, built a big network of people that I'm still in contact with today. Mm -hmm. And some of them have come on this show already. So yep. definitely can recommend that. Expose yourself, build, you know, make connections. Mm -hmm. ah, solid advice. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch? Yeah, definitely on my work profile, like from the ZHAW, so the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. So if you Google my name with ZHAW, <laughs> yeah, exactly, then you will find me and all my contacts and also on Google Scholar. That's pretty much up to date. I also have a LinkedIn where you also can find me under my name, Katrin Parkinson. Yeah. And we'll definitely put that and other links to what we spoke about today in the show notes. But Katrin, thank you very much for your time. And like I do with every guest on the show, I always give my guests the last word. So one last message for the listeners to take away from today. Mm, I would say think about synergies <laughs> and collaboration. Like think about like not only the problems and the conflicts but also like how we connect more and how we can find also synergies between things thank you very much and that wraps up our interesting entertaining and fascinating episode with Katrin Parketzer for more information on the mysteries of lichen a policy instrument toolbox for changing the world or some insights on just how many things are hidden beneath the ground check out the show notes for more information over at peterambach.com slash podcast and as always thank you listeners for tuning into this episode and for your feedback and support if you're enjoying the show, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this podcast with your family, friends, colleagues, and even local politicians. Please also do subscribe or follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. If you are curious about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website or social media. Head to peterembach.com, my YouTube channel Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Peter M. Bach, or Instagram at peterembach87. Feel free to reach out to me with any feedback or guest suggestions so that I can keep improving this show. The podcast's intro and outro song is called Starsky by Alex Kieran. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guest to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges.